Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's ATS webinar on land regeneration and uh, aging, sponsored by the Science and Innovation Center. Next slide. My name is David Lagares from the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. We also have um, Elizabeth Redenti from the National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado, who is going to be uh, helping moderate today's event. I'm really excited about our speaker today, Dr. Tata, who is a leading expert on stem cell biology and land regeneration. Next slide, please. Before we get started, um, I wanted you to, um, uh, I want to make you to be aware of uh, another upcoming webinar for the next um, uh, week on the use of big data in translational research. We hope you can join us if the topic is of interest. Next slide, please. Also, the ATS is hosting a virtual event from um, August 5th through the 10th called the ATS Virtual. Please be on the lookout for additional details on the ATS conference website. Simply use this barcode to register yourself. Next slide, that, that one. So today's webinar will be recorded and will be available online later today or tomorrow on the archive uh, uh, Science Innovation uh, Center webinar videos. Again, use this barcode to access to past, today's, and future SIC webinars. Um, at the end of uh, today's webinar, we will also ask you for your feedback so you can access um, that here as well. So on the next barcode. Next slide. This one. So you can provide your feedback uh, using this barcode. Thank you. Um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to give you a couple of reminders. So the audience will be muted. Uh, however, you will be able to submit your questions using the chat feature. Given the number of uh, registrants today, we strongly advise you to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we will have uh, 15 minutes uh, for Q&A at the end of the talk. Both Elizabeth and myself will be moderating uh, the discussion. Um, with that, I would like to introduce you to the speaker today, Dr. Tata, who is an assistant professor of cell biology at Duke University. So Tata received his PhD from University of Ulm in Germany, and then moved to the Boston to pursue his postdoctoral training at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. During his time in Boston, Tata uncovered novel cellular communication between stem cells and progenitor cells, and the cellular plasticity mechanisms that operate in tissue homeostasis and regeneration and tumorogenesis. Uh, a few years back, uh, he, uh, Dr. Tata, established his own laboratory at Duke University, and the Tata Laboratories, uh, Laboratory continues investigating cellular mechanisms controlling organ homeostasis and regeneration in multiple tissues, including the lungs. So welcome, Dr. Tata. Thank you, David. Thank you for the generous um, kind introduction. Um, again, thank you, David, Liz, and the entire ATS community for having me here, hosting me here today. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss um, some of our ongoing and um, some published work that came from our lab. So, title of my talk is Modeling Lung Regeneration and Disease at Single Cell Resolution. So, today, I'll be briefly discussing about some of the model systems that we have been building to understand lung regeneration, you know, in general lung biology, but also to study some lung diseases, mainly focusing on pulmonary fibrosis, but I'll also uh, briefly touch about COVID infection and other things. Before I get to my presentation, I have a couple of disclosures to go through. Um, so over the years, my interest has been mainly looking at cells, cellular, cell lineages, cellular hierarchies. So what I mean to say is, you know, we know every body, every tissue, every organ, every tissue is made up of cells. And of course, here I'm particularly, we are particularly interested in the lung. That's our favorite lung. And what we are interested in is what are the cells, the cell types that are present in the lung. And out of these, we know some cells act as stem cells, some are progenitor, some are differentiated cells. And one of the key question uh, we have been, my lab has been interested in understanding is during development, once, one or other way these cells are built, but once they are built, how do they maintain? So now the question you may ask like, you know, why is that important? 
as you can imagine, you know, once we reach certain stage, we reach the so-called homeostasis. Every tissue acquires certain so-called homeostasis. Particularly in the lung, this is so important because lung tissue normally is very quiescent. Unless there is damage, these cells don't respond. But when there is damage, they have tremendous regenerative cap cap capacity, uh, meaning they can replicate and they can generate the lost cells. So that's where my interests have been um, in the past uh, seven or eight years. So uh, during my postdoc time and also the more recent work, what we have done is we try to understand how are these cell types, different cell types or cell states organized and how they communicate to maintain the so-called homeostasis. And I'm not getting into the details, but over the years we learned that these cells are constantly communicate, even at a homeostasis, even during the quiescent state. Um, there are some positive and negative signals, both back and forth signals that maintain these hierarchies. And when there is a, 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 a mutation or some uh, recurrent injury, some of these pathways are broken and um, dysregulated. And that's where you see cells can actually change from a differentiated cell to a stem cell state in certain diseases. Again, I'm not going to go through all that. That's all published. Again, for this, I mean, this audience, I don't have to go through all the details, but just to give you an idea, we have this very proximal airways uh, along the respiratory tract. We can see the uh, nasal epithelium and um, uh, pharynx, larynx, and the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, which are then connected to the terminal alveoli. My lab has been particularly interested in two aspects of lung biology. One is studying submucosal glands. And the other part is looking into alveolar regeneration. So first I'll start with the submucosal glands. What are submucosal glands? So submucosal glands, as is shown here and also here, so we know the surface epithelium, which is widely studied in the community. We know the cell types that are present and also now uh, through the single cell transcriptome analysis. Now we know some of the rare cell types besides the major basal cells, club cells, ciliated cells. I'm not going to touch the, that part today, but um, we have been fascinated by the, the, the submucosal glands. So submucosal glands are embedded within the airway tissue, but they are present in the mucosa. That's why you call them submucosal glands. And um, at least from my point of view, uh, to our knowledge, we know very little about these tissues. And again, here we are interested in what are the cells that are present and are their hierarchies, meaning their stem, are their stem cells, progenitors, differentiated cells. So to address these questions, what we did is first, we have performed a single cell transcriptome analysis on the submucosal glands. I'm not going to go through the data. Uh, the data from mouse has been already published, which I'll show a little bit. Uh, but the human is unpublished. Again, I'm not touching that. But broadly, uh, in real life, this is how they look. So this is the lumen of the airway. This is the surface epithelium. And then these are the glands. These are beautiful structures. And when we did the single cell transcriptome analysis, we identified the cell types that are previously known. No surprises. But what we found is there are some subtypes within these serous cells, mucous cells, uh, which we will be describing in a couple of months. I'm not going to touch that too much today, just for the uh, brevity of the time. But there are some markers we came across, and there is one marker particularly important is SOX9, which is present in all gland cells. So one can call pan glandular marker. And then uh, besides that, not only single cell transcriptome analysis, but now we made mouse models to label these cells, isolate them, to do linear tracing, but also to pattern signaling pathways. And during the course of the time, what we found is, so here is the submucosal gland in a 3D maximum intensity projection, where you see this is the surface, this is the gland pore, through, uh, through which the gland contents are expelled out to the lumen. And there is the duct, there are tubules which are then connected to the very terminal uh, structures called SNI. 
And so to understand if there are any, to find if there are any stem cells, progenitals, differentiated cells, what we did is simply we use uh, injury models. The idea here is when we damage the tissue, then we can ask, are there any cells replicating? Can, they, uh, can these cells replicate? Can they repair themselves? So to do that, we simply perform the injury experiment. So this is a control epithelium, how it looks. So this picture is slightly different from this. So now we are looking through the lumen. So basically this is the point of um, um, image that was taken. That's the focal plane view. And this is the control on the surface. These are the gland pits again. But after naphthalene injury, we saw many cells that are normally supposed to be present in the glands appear on the surface, or at least we saw the markers. One of them is smooth muscle actin. So smooth muscle actin marks the myoepithelial cells in the glands, but not, 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 none of the cells on the surface express these markers. And we tested this in not only naphthalene, four other injury models, chlorine, sulfur dioxide, flu, uh, but we also have some transgenic models to damage the surface epithelium. In all these models, we observed the same findings. Now the question is, what are these markers expressing cells? Are they de novo generated? Meaning uh, the surface cells expressing these markers, the gland markers, or gland markers are, uh, gland cells are migrating to the surface. So to probe that, again, I'm not showing the data today, but we use the, the mouse models we developed and we linear stress. So simply we labeled the cells in the gland and then we uh, injured the airways. And what we found is gland cells migrate to the surface and repopulate the surface epithelium, which was a clear surprise to me because I've been working on it for, uh, for the last eight to nine years and we never actually uh, thought of that. There were some indications. Um, there, was, there was some data from Scott Randall's group at UNC um, and also Bridget Gompert's group at uh, UCLA have indicated, but now using this single cell transcriptome uh, and I'll coupled with linear tracing analysis, we now have definitively uh, showed that that happens. So here is the summary of it. So normally this is how the glands look. The surface is surface, glands are glands, no contribution from one to the other, but when there is damage, gland cells, particularly these myoepithelial cells, very fascinating cell type, um, migrates to the surface and turns into basal cells and the club cells, ciliated cells. And now currently we are looking into what are the mechanisms that, are uh, uh, that, that drive these processes. Um, and this work was published um, almost two years ago and there was actually a back-to-back -back paper from John Engelhardt's group uh, we published at the same time. So that's it from the submucosal glands. I'm not going to talk much here, but I'm happy to discuss later in the session. And with this, we now are able to, uh, we, uh, we added a new cell type to the airway lineage hierarchy, meaning we have a multipotent reserve stem cell. We call it reserve because they are sitting are uh, embedded within the airway tissues, and normally they don't do much, but when there is damage, they can actually reactivate the signaling to repopulate the airway cells. Now, getting into the alveoli, um, again, for this community, the, I don't think I need to introduce much, but I'll give a brief. So in the alveoli, there are two major epithelial cells. There are many fibroblasts and endothelium. I'm not going to touch too much about it, very briefly, for about the fibroblasts. We have two major cell types, alveolar type two cells, which can serve as stem progenitors of the airway epithelium. There are many studies using linear tracing and culture experiments have shown that, that these cells can proliferate and generate type one cells. And so one of the questions we have been really interested in is, when we look at the alveoli, it's a very thin, delicate tissue, at least to my eyes, that's the way uh, we see it. And within the epithelium, the, there are two, the two epithelial cells. One is the cuboidal type two, but then the type one cell. As you all know, type one cell is very extremely thin, flat, and large, large cell. And how does this look? Here is a picture, as you can see. Now we are looking at through the lumen in the alveolus, where you see this green, that, that the cell that is shown here at the yellow, 
the cell that is shown here is the type 1 cell. It's extremely thin. And now we have some insights into it. It's nothing but two lipid layers just put together. In some areas, we don't even see the cytoskeleton, that extremely thin. And so the question is, you know, being a uh, cell biologist, to me, one question is, how can these type 2 cells, which is present here, the small cuboidal cell, turn into this yellow cell? It's amazing, right? Because this is one of the thinnest cells. Now it's considered one of the thinnest cells. It, um, as you can see, the area of a, an average area of a type 1 cell is extremely large. I'm not aware of any cell that has that, la that large. And overall, they, um, the, there, is, there are some estimates of how many cells, are, how many type 1 cells are in human lung. Again, I'm not getting into the details. But the question is, how, when there is damage, how can this type 2 cell turn into type 1? So the question is, why do we need to study this? Again, in normal, we know this happens, but there are certain diseases. It has been postulated that there is a blockade in this process, meaning we do not see um, type 1 cells in these um, damaged lungs, uh, particularly in the fibrotic lungs. So there is a need to understand this process. And to study this, one of the challenges you can imagine is, as I mentioned, these are extremely thin. So to isolate these, to maintain them in culture, it's, uh, the, to um, profile them, to do biochemical assays, it's really challenging. We cannot get many cells. Uh, for example, we can get plenty of type 2 cells, but very uh, few type 1 cells we can get from the lungs. So to overcome this challenge, what we decided is to go into organoid models. So as you all know, in the lung, there are organoid models. Um, so the classical model that was developed a few years ago uses type 2 cells and fibroblast co-cultures. Mix, when mixed together in matrigel, they make nice organoids. And they, represent, they have the cells, um, representative cell types type 2 and type 1. But one challenge here is, or one limitation here is, this culture system is a niche dependent meaning you need stromal cells, without which they don't grow. The type 2 cells do not grow. And also not ideal for genetic and pharmacological studies. And also the classic medium uses serum, which has many unknown factors. And also it, has, it undergoes spontaneous differentiation, meaning we cannot control at this point. They make type 2, type 1. It's hard to manage um, the number of the types of cell types. So to overcome this, what we did is we utilized this system and we performed single cell transcriptome analysis. So the idea here is when we know the stromal cells can support these type 2 cells, the question is, what are the factors? Can we use transcriptome analysis, particularly single cell transcriptome, and then find what are the factors that come from each of these cell types uh, that, so that these type 2 cells can be grown, cultured, without stroma? So that's what we did. So this is the single cell transcriptome data from organoids that were cultured in MTech media for 10 days. And then broadly, as you can see, there are epithelial cells, there are stromal cells, or the fibroblasts, that's what we seeded. Um, but now the, um, then we asked, what are the signals that communicate? And that's what precisely we did. And I'm not going to get into the details, you know, uh, the each and every molecule, but broadly, we found many signaling ligands in fibroblasts and the, the corresponding receptors in the type 2 cells. But also we found certain antagonists that are produced by the fibroblasts, which turned out to be really informative uh, in order to maintain type 2 cell or to differentiate them. So what we did is we modulated all these factors in culture and asked, can we culture type 2 cells without strong? And that's what we did. So now, using the newly developed system, we can eliminate straw money, but also we completely defined the meaning. We know each and every component and the concentration of each factor we add. So there is no serum involved. Every chem uh, chemical is, or every growth factor is well-defined in this case. So by doing this, we achieved a serum-free, feeder-free expansion medium, but different, also differentiation medium, meaning we can maintain only type 2 cells or differentiate them into type 1. Yeah, so now we have that ability. I'll show you some data. 
So this is how the classic old model looks. We do get organoids, they are mixed, but when we, uh, in our new serum-free, feeder-free system, the organoids are much bigger, the colony forming efficiency is much higher, and they make these beautiful structures in differentiation conditions. And as I mentioned, so previous culture system was about five to 7% uh, colony farming efficiency, but now we have about 20 to 25% of the colony farming efficiency, which is very robust, and also the colony size. So using the single cell driven interactome analysis, not only we found the factors that communicate between these cells, but we now uh, are able to replace the feeders, feeders and replace all unknown components and achieve the a serum free feeder free condition. And these organoids are not simply a mass of cells, but if you leave them long enough, they do develop into certain structures. They, you know, I'm not calling it a lung, but they resemble some, some lung structures. And uh, they retain the classical uh, uh, the key um, characteristics, including surfactants, they produce surfactants, they express all the um, canonical markers of the type 2 cells or type 1 cells in different conditions. And uh, as I mentioned, we can maintain them in self-renewing, meaning mostly type 2 cells. You can see here about 95 to, uh, 90 to 95% of the cells are type 2 cells as shown with the surfactant protein C. Very few rare type 1 cells we see. And then in differentiation condition, we see the flip of it. Now we have many type 1 cells uh, in this condition. So we never get only type one cells in this case, it's a mixture of it. So it's a type two, type one mixture in this case. But nevertheless, we do get good differentiation. We have developed these conditions for both mouse as well as human, and it works very well. And you, what we can do with this, I'm not showing the data, but now we, we have the ability to do genome editing using CRISPR technologies. Uh, we engrafted these into animals and into NSG mice, particularly for the human cells. Um, and uh, to test the, whether they can sustain uh, or maintain 82 and 81 characteristics of the transplantation, and they do so well. And also we used, you know, the, this is the need of the other. We also use this for the COVID test, um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus testing. As you can see, we collaborated with Ralph Barrett's lab, which developed a, um, uh, a GFP fusion tag. So these are controls, we do not see GFP, but here we see, uh, we found some really interesting uh, phenotypes after uh, uh, responses in type two cells, type one cells after infection. Again, I'm not getting into the details of it. And now going back to my original question, so how does this type one cell turn into type two? Uh, so type, type two cells turn into type one. What are the mechanisms? What are the pathways involved in this process? Now that we have these beautiful organoids, can we use this system? And that's what precisely we did. And just to illustrate how um, uh, finally we can map this process, here is a simple um, image that shows type one cells, how they, uh, um, uh, as they turn into type one, how they spread out and turn into these beautiful structures. And uh, this is where we perform single cell transcriptome analysis to understand these individual uh, steps, what, ha what happens during these, this process. Here is the data. Um, as you can see, you know, um, I guess most of you are familiar with single cell data, but uh, for those who are not, these, see each dot is a cell from these cultures, organoids, and we can see type two cells, which are marked in red. We see purple, proliferating type two cells. We see type one cells, but we also surprisingly came up with a population uh, which we never knew before. Uh, this population is here. We didn't know what those were. And when we looked for markers, we saw very distinct markers that are only present in this population that circled one. Uh, for example, cloud in four, CTGF, only present in this, but not in the type two, proliferating, not in the type, proliferating type two, uh, not in the type one. Uh, which we validated. There are many markers here, as you can see. So we call these PATs. I'll tell you why we call them PATs in a minute. But in organoids, we validated. We have the, um, uh, by immunostaining, we could find these uh, cells. It's not something random. And then we wonder what, what this population is. 
are they related to type two, type one? What those are? We know they came from type two because that's the that's what we seeded in the cultures. And then we further probe using certain computational tools, um, particularly one called RNA velocity. Uh, what it does is it uses the ratios of unspliced and spliced transcripts to assess uh, to to uh, uh, predict cell trajectories. So using that, what we found is these paths are generating type one. As you can see, the arrows. So the arrows indicate these paths are about to turn into type one cells. And we then asked, do we see them in vivo? So we, we used multiple injury models. Here I'm showing from bleomycin. As you can see, bleomycin type two cells nicely. Uh, that's marked by surfactant protein driven reporter. And on early stages, you can, one can see the cloud in four is coming up. And then these roundish cells are now start to extend or stretch out. You can see morpho morphological changes, but also other mark markers come up. So um, we quantified this. As you can see, it undergoes these different markers, have very dynamic expression pattern. And just to summarize that part, type two cells en route to type one, they go through these unique, trans unique transitional cells. That's why we call them pre-AEC1 transitional state. We have very unique markers, which are not present in type two, not neither in type two, nor in type one. And um, so we, we validated this in different injury models. And then we further went back to the single cell transcriptome data to find what are the signaling pathways enriched in this. As you can see, we found high P53 signaling activity. It's not the expression of P53, but uh, it's, it's, it's signaling. And also we saw DNA damage repair happening. We were surprised. And then also uh, we saw tight junctions, cytoskeleton, um, which kind of expected because there was quite some dramatic changes happening. And when we saw P53 signaling and DNA damage, we didn't know what's happening. So we uh, particularly deleted P53 in type two cells using conditional uh, knockout mouse models, but also we performed chromatin IP experiments. For this, we had to develop some new methods because you, know, you don't get enough cells. So we developed a method to do chromatin IP for P53 from small number of cells. Uh, we can do as low as 10,000 cells now, which is described in our, our paper. Um, I'll show you in a minute. So using that, what we found is P53 is binding on promoters of these patch genes, also enhancers. So there are many genes, but two broad categories, cytoskeletal genes, but also senescence and DNA damage associated markers. Again, Using conditional knockout mouse models, we found that P53 signaling is essential for the type two cells to turn into uh, these type one cells. And what happens is they're basically uh, not able to reach that intermediate path state. So they are stuck in uh, that early stages. And another point, we, when we saw this DNA damage, we were surprised. So we wanted to check whether they really exhibit DNA damage. And that's where we used culture platform. As you can see, early days of culture, type two cells, there is no DNA damage, one of the marker, gamma H2X. But late stages, when the cells are stretching out, we found these cells undergo DNA damage. It turns out that when cells start to stretch, the cytoskeleton puts enormous pressure on the nuclear membrane, which breaks nuclear, uh, the chromatin. And no wonder why we see the DNA damage uh, responses or repair pathways. We also found this in vivo. So we used mouse models, conditional mouse models, where we damaged the type one cells and where we saw type uh, two cells en route to type one, they go through this intermediate. That's what is shown here, this marker, cloud in four. They show DNA damage happening. Fortunately, um, these cells can repair that. That's why probably the signaling is activated. So when we saw this DNA damage signaling, one thing that really striked us was, um, but before that, I'll briefly summarize. So when there is damage, type two cells acquire this transitional state, which is high for P53 signaling, DNA damage, and also we saw senescence markers. And normally they go through this process. 
in a in a in a in an animal or when we use uh, organoid models they can nicely make type 1 cells but when we saw these signaling pathways uh, we were really intrigued by this um, this activity because as many of you know dna damage senescence age um, are highly implicated in aging but also many lung diseases particularly emphysema and fibrosis and also <clears throat> we know when there is recurrent damage um, such DNA damage responses, but also senescence have been previously um, implicated, although we didn't know where the actually damage is happening, or the way the senescence was act actually activated. And so when we saw this scenario, we wanted to address whether this particular state, the cell state, the transitional state we identified has any role in disease. So that's where we collaborated with um, um, amazing our collaborators, Jonathan Kropsky and Nick Benovich uh, from Vanderbilt and Tijan, uh, who at that time were actually performing single cell RNA sequencing on fibrotic lungs, human fibrotic lungs. So here is the data, that's how it looks. And the red cells are from fibrotic lungs and blue cells are from healthy. And now we can look into individual cell and see what's happening. And as you can see, there are many markers that I showed you before, particularly SFN, FN1, SOX4, many markers showed up in a put Unix population that, that is only uh, highly enriched in IPF lungs, but this is not present in, uh, in the healthy. And other populations are nothing but type two cells and type one cells as shown with the markers. And Again, we saw high activity of P53 signaling, DNA damage, and cellular senescence. And we wanted to check whether the same population actually appears on the fibrotic lungs. So here is a simple immunofluorescence analysis. Uh, these are normal, where we see type 2 cells as shown with the surfactant protein C, but not this new markers, the PATS associated marker. And we do not see smooth muscle actin, which is also called ACTA2, because these are normal lungs. But when we look at the non-fibrotic regions of the IPF lungs or severe fibrotic lungs, we see high levels of ACTA2, the smooth muscle actin, meaning this fibrotic foci, those are nicely lined up by these red stains of uh, SFN. And we also checked many, many other markers, um, which is actually in the paper, <coughs> uh, showing that these indeed come up in the tendency states. And not only those, we also found senescence markers, for example, here P21, but also gamma H2X, which is a DNA damage marker. And for senescence, again, we found, so these are the uh, interstitial thickened regions, and we see these lined up regions have uh, senescent beta gal activity. So further um, uh, indicating that this patch-like population comes up in PC states. So to summarize what I've shown you so far, as I mentioned before, during injury, type two cells acquire this transitional state, which is high for these signalings. And also some of the genes that we identified as a markers are also implicated in IPF as a, some of the mutations in IPF. And in normal, in a permissive environment, these intermediates go on to differentiate into type one cells. But when the, there is a non-permissive milieu, these transitional states are stuck, they persist, and they, uh, we think they communicate with the fibroblasts and they uh, induce fibrosis. And why I'm saying induce fibrosis, I haven't shown any data here, uh, it's just because of the time, but it's in the details in the paper, which is just actually came out yesterday. Uh, if those who are interested, you may want to look at Kobayashi et al. And what we found is that these paths are the ones that produce high TGF beta. So the idea here is the longer these paths persist or stay in the, in, the, in the tissue, they produce more TGF beta to the fibroblast, which then uh, activate the, the, the myofibroblast and the fibrogenesis. Again, I'm not going to go through all that, but I'm happy to discuss that. And to um, acknowledge the people who have done this work, 
So these are the, my lab members, uh, particularly Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi Kobayashi and Alexander, who are the co-first authors on this paper, have done an amazing work to uh, do this much of the pads and fibrosis work. And the hero uh, who developed the organoid culture system uh, that, that manuscript hasn't been, is not published. And Arvind Konkmarla, who uh, contributed to some of the work and other lab members. We also have many undergrads who actively contribute to the lab. And also our collaborators, particularly uh, Scott Randall, uh, who has been giving us the tissue. Um, um, he has been helping us uh, very, um, we are very thankful to, um, thankful to him for providing the tissues. And Christina Barkauskos, who is also at Duke, and Patty Lee, who recently joined, we have been collaborating with them. And also special thanks to John and Nick for sharing their data and also funding resources. And uh, that's all from my end. Uh, before I get to that, if anyone is interested, we have a couple of postdoc positions open in our lab and uh, feel free to forward it to your trainees. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Fantastic, Tata. Thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. I will just have to say your data is beautiful, your imaging, um, and how you have gone about so carefully to develop these almost reductionist systems with the organoid um, is quite inspiring. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start because we have questions coming in from the chat. So I'll get to those first. Um, and the first question... Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, the first question that we have um, is asking about if you have seen these transitional cells um, in response to chronic viral infection or injury, which is clearly on everybody's mind right now with COVID. Yes, indeed, actually. So we do have a manuscript currently and we indeed see them. All right, that's great. I'm sure everyone yeah. on here will be anxious to- Yeah, so one thing I just want to make a point is, so these transitional states are not just one injury type. So whenever there is a damage to the type one cell, type two cells replicate and go through, uh, go through this, this process. And we have tested it in multiple injury models. So I'll just follow up to that question quickly. I was thinking though about other diseases like COPD or emphysema where you also see a, a loss of an epithelial cell population, but obviously not the same kind of regeneration or stuck regeneration. Do you think the cell is playing a role? There? Yeah. So um, that is something we are currently exploring, but recently there is a paper from uh, Naftali Kaminsky group at Yale, where they have done single cell transcriptome analysis on COPD lungs. And in that case, they, do, they did not see as many these intermediate states as they saw or we saw in fibrosis, meaning in fibrosis, we see many of these, uh, but, in, but in COPD cases also, they did find some. Right, interesting. Yeah, that's an active uh, area of what we are currently looking into. So clearly an important cell for regeneration. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, the next question on here is, um, how can we now reconcile the therapeutic use of senolytics in diseased lungs? Will PATS be targeted so that regeneration is blocked? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so. I know there are a couple of, even I, I think there are even clinical trials, if I remember correctly, targeting the senescence using senolytics. Uh, the question comes is, you know, we have to understand in IPF, these cells are accumulating and whether blocking senescence itself is sufficient because I think what one need to do is one need to target the stem cell because that's where the underlying problems might be. So the reason I'm saying one need, might be one need to target this cell state because we know there are many mutations associated with, for example, surfactant mutations. So those are normally happening at this state. And those changes in the type two cells are maybe not allowing these cells to turn into these packs and further into type one cells, but also DNA damage signaling um, uh, some of the components in DNA damage signaling have been implicated in um, IPF mutations. So um, I think one need to see where the problem is, you know, um, whether that, that's, that's the cells are stuck in this state or they are not able to reach this point because, um, you know, as I mentioned, TJ beta is coming from these PAD states, but it's also possible that other cells can also produce in certain mutant states. 
Right, great. So uh, next question, which kind of follows along that talking about changes in type two cells and how that may affect their transition is what do you think about shortened telomere length in the type two cells and their exhaustion? And may this affect PAT transition or TGF beta production? Yeah, <laughs> that's something uh, we don't know at this point because we haven't actually looked into that part. Um, we have been talking to um, John and um, other groups that uh, Vanderbilt to look into that. But at least at this point, what we think is the telomere associated mutations may not be telomerase and the telomeric RNA associated mutations may not be directly related to the telomere length, but not in all cases, that's what I mean, right? But mutations in those can actually cause DNA damage, that's known. Because when there is no telomerase, DNA damage is um, um, happening throughout the genome, not only at the termini of the telomere, the chromosomes. So we think it's beyond telomere length. Perfect. So uh, we have more questions coming in. That's great. So what about the link complex bridges the cytoskeleton to the nucleus for your work showing 80, 82 to 81 transition with increased DNA damage mm -hmm. from forces acting to the nucleus? Have you considered disrupting the link complex to reduce forces to the nucleus? Yeah, I mean, we don't know. We currently actually, we built some mouse models, conditional mouse models to understand these processes. So we are um, targeting both actins and cytokeratins, but also microtubules, different, uh, like, you know, different components so that we can, uh, different genes so that we can target uh, actin only, or uh, microtubules only, or uh, cytoskeleton only. Uh, because we certainly see the many cytokeratins coming up in this state. Um, so I think that's understanding that process is important before we, you know, think of anything. How do we prevent the DNA damage? Actually, related to that question, I have a question regarding the mechanobiology of this process. Yeah. Uh, do you think this transition from AT2 to PATS mm -hmm. happens at the stem cell niche or, or the stem cells have to leave to the uh, injured area and that's where the transition happens? You know what I mean? Do they yeah. migrate to a, a different mechanical niche uh, where they differentiate? Yes, indeed, actually. So we have been doing some live imaging, which is, again, not published. Um, 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 my apologies for not showing that data. But um, we indeed see the type 2 cells actually migrate. Perfect. We have another question. It says, uh, do you describe a permissive versus a non-permissive milieu? Mm -hmm. but it's also possible that there are defects in the AT2 cells themselves. And it is not much the milieu, uh, such as telomere, telomerase, surfactant, uh, Hermansky put up mutations related to what you are discussing now. Basically, if there is any intrinsic uh, defect in the AT2 cells that uh, can lead to this um, defective phenotype in the paths. Yeah, that's really an interesting question. I think it goes back to one of my previous, I think one of Liz's question is, so, in surfactant mittens, for example, most of these brycos mittens, so we've been actually mutating these in organoid cultures. And what we think is happening is these type two cells, when they have this excessive ER stress, so they are actually trying to differentiate. They're not able to maintain the type two cell state, but they are trying to differentiate and they are, they are stuck in that they're kind of I wouldn't say wobbling between this type two and PATS, but they are t stuck in that intermediate state. And that's why we think um, they, they are acting as a fibrogenic. So it's some of the mutations that we are mapping currently are directly related to the type two, for example, the surfactants. But there are some that we are actively looking at the cytoskeleton stretching. So when there is problem with the cytoskeleton, we do again see the same issue with um, pads stuck in that state because they are not able to further extend. Right. I, I read your paper this morning. It's great. Congratulations. And uh, it really caught my eye, the phenotype of your uh, epithelial-specific P53 knockout mice. Yes. You mm -hmm. show you got an accumulation of these pad cells. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the cellular phenotype is clear. Uh, have uh -huh. you got the... Uh, 
fibrosis phenotype? It is not shown in the paper, but yes, I, yes, do that's you get a, more fibrosis in these mice? So that's a great question. So that's actually a follow-up <laughs> work we are doing. <laughs> so what we see is P53, not only it regulates the cytoskeletal and some of the uh, cell cycle regulators and senescence markers, what we also see is it also regulates some of the pro-fibrotic genes. So what it means is it's inducing that state, but it's also controlling pro-fibrotic. So when you don't have P53, we do not, not, we do not actually see the fibrosis. So what happens is they acquire a state that resembles PADS-like state, but it's a semi. So it's not fully, for example, um, we also found P53 directly binds on TGF beta. So if you don't have P53, there is no TGF beta and thereby there is no fibrosis. Yeah, so we didn't describe that uh, complete details in the manuscript, but that's something we are now working on. Yeah, so, you know, just to give you a glimpse of it, what we think is that P53 signaling, it's actually controlling into a, you know, the type 2 cell state in a degenerative state or acquire a, uh, a, a tumorogenic state. So, for example, you know, they go on to develop some uh, adenomas and other things. Yeah. All right. Fantastic, Tata. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank you again for your fantastic presentation and your participation in this Science and Innovation Center um, webinar. And thank you to everybody who has logged on today to watch. Please remember to um, click on the link that's in the chat now to fill out your survey um, to give your feedback. And we look forward to seeing you at other SIC webinars in the future. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone.